There we go. Alright. Uh, what's up guys? I uh, know I haven't really done a video or anything in a while. Uh, do have a topic for today, but just for a few minutes I kind of wanted to talk about why I haven't been doing uh, a video. And there's a few reasons for it. Not all of them are bad. Um, move my laptop here. And I also wanted to talk a uh, few talk a little bit more about um some changes that I'm going to be doing to these videos. Uh, I still like doing it. Don't get me wrong. I'm still loving doing it. Uh, it's just what I've noticed is the first two videos I did, there were like tons of people just right off the bat, which was awesome. And that's what got me really excited about it. Um, but it seemed like the interest had dwindled down a little bit and that might have just been because of the time frame I was doing it. So, and also because of how often I was doing it, which, uh, the number of people was another reason I haven't been doing this as often, but not the main reason. So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, I'm not good with change, like at all. And the newly enforced lockdowns has been a change I'm not good at. Um, extremely, anybody that knows me knows this is true. I'm extremely extroverted. Um, I'm not, also, reason I'm blinking so much, uh, I went outside, they're cutting the fields across my house again. My allergies are horrible, so my eyes are super, like, dry and burning right now. So, just ignore the excessive blinking. But, um, um, excessively extroverted. That's just something about me. I love being around people. I get all my energy from being around people. Uh, I'm happiest when I'm around people. And I also had a very specific routine. Uh, get up, get my coffee, get dressed, grab my bag, go to school, and from 9 in the morning until some days 8 p.m., I was constantly, constantly around people that I absolutely loved, around some of my best friends. Uh, some of these friends I've even started to call family. And when I wasn't at school, my routine was to go to work from first thing in the morning until, uh, you know, pretty late here recently. It was until 6 p.m., our new hours. And with these new changes, that daily routine that I was so used to was gone, which was, I, I know it was nobody's fault. It was just bizarre. And like I said, I'm not good at change. Um, and these videos was a distraction from that. Not only for me, but for, you know, whoever decides to watch these, even if you don't watch them when I do it live, uh, which we're going to talk about that. So even if you just watch them after I share them on Facebook, you know, these, this was a little bit of a distraction just so get all that negativity and drama off of Facebook, have some fun. Um, and even though I was still, and I'm still super excited to do these videos and I still love doing them, I didn't want to do them if I wasn't at my absolute best. I don't want to come up here and record myself trying to do a program and a presentation if my mind isn't in it. So, took a little bit of a break because I was getting a little bit down. So, wanted to be sure that if I keep doing these videos, I wanted to wait a minute until I'm at, you know, my top game. I want to be right up here when I do these videos. I want to do way down here. Y'all came here to see some little southern boy get all excited and talk about cool stuff, not mopey southern boy way down here looking absolutely depressed while still try, trying to talk about stuff. Uh, I'm fine now, but that was the main reason these videos have been kind of on hold. Uh, the second reason, I was doing them back to back. I was doing a video each day, usually about 30 minutes. And that was awesome. I like doing it. But um, what a few people have told me and what I was starting to notice too, doing them back to back constantly like that, I have a lot I can talk about, but I would run out of topics pretty easily. Because I like doing these videos 
with you know stuff you guys can actually see. And uh, if I use all, up all my stuff, then you know it'd be a little bit harder. Um, so I also wanted to space these videos out a little bit, kind of do them a little bit more scarce. So that way, more time to prepare, more time to get my notes, and uh, just so I don't run out of topics as easily. So those are the only two reasons that I haven't been doing videos as often. But like I said when I first started this, this is probably going to be something that I keep doing. And um, some really good coffee. I'm also kind of wanting to mess with the format a little bit. Because while I absolutely love this format, Facebook Live is only a lot of fun if people are joining in Facebook Live for, you know, the conversation aspect. So, I'm probably still going to do it on Facebook Live, but part of me also kind of wants to move it over to YouTube and do more of a podcast type scenario for this and then share the videos from YouTube to my Facebook. Uh, that's probably what I'm going to start doing. Uh, so, with all that out of the way, and you guys can comment and tell me whatever you think about all that I just said later on. But uh, with all that out of the way, today's topic... I didn't get much feedback since the last video. I, uh, the last video, I pretty much said, hey, uh, y'all are going to choose the topic of the next video. And I actually only got one message, and they wanted me to touch a little bit on arrowheads. And we're going to talk about arrowheads. That's the main topic of today. And But I got another message, and they were interested more in... The Egyptian stuff that I mentioned. So, the main topic of today is going to be arrowheads. Excuse me. We're going to talk a little bit about Egyptian mythology. And uh, kind of like their mindset. And how their mindset... And believe it or not, the Egyptians believed in some crazy stuff. Just going to throw that out there. Some of their beliefs were a little bit wild. But believe it or not, a lot of their beliefs carried over into, I don't want, I almost said modern day settlement period, into like the 1800 settlement period. A lot of the stuff that you see in the 1800s, you can trace all the way back to ancient Egypt mythology. So we're going to touch just a little bit on uh, Egyptian mythology. Not too much, because Egyptian mythology, if I go really into depth on that, I want to save that for its own video. The other reason I'm kind of touching on it today is because out of the two messages or two feedbacks that I got, uh, one of them said arrowheads, one of them said a little bit of Egyptian mythology. So I kind of want to touch on both just because that's the feedback that I got. But again, main topic is going to be arrowheads. And then at the end of the video, uh, we're going to talk about the next topic for the next video. And... Probably even my plans going forward if I want to stay with Facebook Live or if I want to go ahead and move over to YouTube. Uh, again, Facebook Live is awesome. I really like it. But it's only fun if enough people join for a lot of interaction. So that's why I've been debating on YouTube. But um, yeah, like I said, end of the video, we're going to talk about the next topic, which is going to be sometime next week. I'm going to start spacing these out a lot more. One, so I can better schedule it. And two, so I don't run out of ideas or get too burnt out so I can balance some of the stuff that I got going on a little bit easier. Because I'm also starting to work from home now. So, uh, you know, kind of got to leave room for everything. But all that boring talk out of the way, we're going to jump right back into Native American stuff. I've done so many, pretty much every video I've done so far. Somebody has always wanted to hear about Native American. And um, don't get me wrong, I love it. Native American history and Native American mythology is some of my favorite stuff to talk about. It just kind of surprised me that out of everything I've talked about in videos, that's been people's favorite for me to talk about. Uh, I'm also messing with a little bit of a different setup right now. It's not at all professional. Right now the camera is sitting on a beer glass. Um, but... Anyway, uh, so jumping right back into Native American history. Arrowheads are something that, as soon as you say the word arrowheads, 
People instantly know what you're talking about. They're super, super popular. A lot of people collect them. A lot of people pay very high money for what is essentially a carved rock. Which, before I continue, let me actually grab something real quick. Here we go. You can tell I'm a professional programmer because I totally have everything I need on the table ahead of time. <laughs> but people pay a lot of money for, again, what is essentially just a carved out piece of rock. Now, before we get into this, one thing I always love to tell people when I talk about arrowheads is, for one, I am not, if you collect arrowheads, that's awesome. Obviously, I do too. I'm not at all devaluing your collection when I say this. When I say what I'm about to say, do not take it the wrong way. I'm talking from a Native American's point of view on an arrowhead. So, don't get offended if you collect arrowheads. I just wanted to throw that out there real quick. But this is what I always love to tell people about arrowheads. They are really not that valuable. Nowadays, yeah, they're awesome. They're awesome pieces of history. And they're starting to become a very popular art form. To Native Americans, not at all. These, these little arrowheads right here are not at all valuable. And... I'm sorry if you can't see them. I'm going to be holding these up as I talk about them. Because here in a minute, we're going to talk about the different types of arrowheads. But um, to a Native American, these are tools. These are literally just tools. They would value an arrowhead almost as much as we would value a Kleenex. And the reason for that is, again, these are tools. If one broke, they would just toss it, grab a rock, and make a new one. So, they didn't value these, like we value them, as super awesome and super important treasures. These were tools. If they broke, oh well, throw it in the dirt, grab a rock, let's make a new one. So, with that out of the way, what we're going to do is, first off, we're going to talk about how an arrowhead starts. And I'm not going to demonstrate it, because I've been trying to learn Right now, I don't have the equipment, and I'm also really not that good at it right now. I can show you one that I try to make later on. But we're going to talk about the arrowhead from start to finish. We're going to talk about the different types of arrowheads. And then we're going to talk about applications. And after that, if there's no questions, we'll get into the Egyptian mythology. But arrowhead from start to finish. Literally just a rock. Um, usually whenever we find arrowheads, they're going to be made out of either flint or chert. And the reason for that, this little piece of flint that I have right here, raw flint, the reason that this would be the most popular rock, and I know if you're a geology nerd, I'm going to keep calling them rocks. I'm sure there's probably a proper term for them. Correct me if you want to. I'm calling it a rock. But this piece of flint. Uh, the way that it's formed, and the Native Americans found this out, the way that it's formed, let me correct myself, indigenous people, not just our Native Americans, because our Native Americans, aren't, or our indigenous people, aren't the only ones that would have used arrowheads. Arrowheads, you're going to find them, you're going to find stone worked weapons in a lot of different tribes. But, um, so all indigenous people, but for our intents and purposes and for this presentation, just think about Native Americans. Um, they found that flint and shirt like this, when you broke it off, it broke off into flakes. And when you break off that flake, it's already sharp. It is already very, very sharpened. And it's not hard to break it a little bit more to make into a point. And what's really cool if you go and watch Flint Nappers now, when we, Flint Nappers is the term used for people that make arrowheads, as you know, modern day as like an art form. 
What's really cool, if you go and look at a modern day flint napper, they're using metal tools usually and not discrediting flint nappers at all because it's something I haven't been able to learn yet and it's awesome to watch and they make some awesome looking arrowheads. But they use metal tools. Native Americans would be breaking this piece of flint using smooth stones like these. And I just recently found out because a friend of mine came over and looked at him. And I just recently found out this is the incorrect rock to use to even try to break, break flint, or flint. Break flint. But it does still have the same kind of shape and general look of the proper stones that they would be using. Yeah, no, Pits and Mounds, that is an abs that's one of my all-time favorite state parks. I love Pits and Mounds. They're Archeofest. I've worked Archeofest every year for the past three years. Their flint napping is amazing. Uh, definitely go to Pits and Mounds if you can during Archeofest and watch their flint naps. But the Native Americans wouldn't be using metal tools like modern-day flint nappers use. They would be using normal old stones, not these stones, but normal stones that would be a little bit circular, kind of like a river stone, just like those. And that's what they would use to shape their arrowheads. And it would be flint or chert. Those are the most common. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there are some arrowheads made out of completely different materials. But the ones that we're going to be talking about and looking at today are flint and chert based. Because that's what I have on the table right here. I have a bunch of different ones. Now, with all that out of the way, after they make it, then you get your actual application. Now, if you go to a museum or just look up arrowheads online, no two arrowhead is going to be the same shape. And for the most part, the reason they're not the same shape is because it is impossible to break this piece of flint the same way and get the same looking flake every time you do it. You're always going to get different kind of imperfections, different kind of bumps, different cracks. It's always going to be different. But there is a bit more of a deeper meaning behind the different looks. And sorry I keep fussing over everything. I always fidget and I'm never going to be happy with this setup. So sorry that I'm fidgeting. Uh, and if I look over to the side, I've started to bring all my notes up here with me. So anytime I'm looking to the side, it's just my PowerPoint. Uh, anyway, their applications. There's a lot deeper meaning behind the different shapes and sizes. And that meaning has to do with what they'd be hunting, which is really, really cool to think about. Because obviously nowadays, if we're going to go hunting, ammo is pretty universal. I'm not a hunter. I stick with fishing, so if I say this wrong, correct me, but I'm pretty sure ammo is mostly universal. You shoot it, it's going to work, it's going to kill the animal. Native Americans found that different sized arrowheads do the work a lot easier. Different types of ammunition. And one thing before I start holding these up, this arrowhead right here is the only one that I have found myself. Uh, all the other ones on the table, these were all a gift. These were a gift from two different people. And I'm not going to say their name in the video just in case they want to remain anonymous. But these are all uh, these were all gifts aside from the one here in the middle. But anyway, what they found, different size for different game. You have your very large style arrowheads for your larger game. Uh, something like this. Yes, it could be used on a deer. However, one like this, oh my nose, is most likely going to be used on much bigger game like your buffalo, elk, you know, something a lot bigger. Deer, deer arrowheads is where we usually find the more universal style, shape, and size. But you also find arrowheads that would be used for much, much smaller game, such as this little guy right here. And I'm keeping this one in the bag because 
It's very, very delicate and super thin. So I don't want to take that one out and risk breaking it. But you also have small arrowheads like this one. And what's really cool, we found that arrowheads this size, Native Americans were actually the first bow fishermen. Now, yes, we have found evidence that they made fish hooks. And they did make fish hooks out of animal bone. But we've also found evidence that they would have used these to bow fish, which I think is really, really cool. Now, what you got to think about, narrow head like this, yeah, that could kill a fish, that could kill a bird, that's also going to ruin a lot more meat, and probably do a lot more damage, which while a lot more damage is good, you want all the meat you can get, whereas an arrowhead like that, a lot more penetration power, this would be a lot easier to just go straight through the bird if you hit it right, and it wouldn't damage as much meat. Same with the fish. But if you took this to a deer, it would probably hurt the deer unless you hit it in the right spot. I don't see this little guy really killing a deer. So you see the different sized arrowheads for different applications. Now, not every arrowhead is an arrowhead. And I know that's weird to say. Arrowhead is a term that people have used for any thing like this. Any piece of flint carved out into a point, people call an arrowhead. And I would have to get my buddy Zach, I'll have to get him down here with me one day to do a talk on this, because he's awesome with Native American history. Uh, he knows every type of arrowhead. But what I've learned from my own research, listening to him and talking to him, is some arrowheads, just like this one, wouldn't be put on an arrow. That would usually be used for a dart or a spear uh, thrown with your atlatl, not an arrow. It's too big and too heavy. So you got to have something a lot bigger. And some of them would also just be used for knife tips. So not every arrow, not every arrowhead is an arrowhead. It's a very broad term that we use for everything that we see. That's a flint carved into a point. So that's just a little brief talk on arrowheads, the creation from start to finish, and application, then your different sizes and the meanings. Now eventually, once I do a little more research, I want to do a video dedicated strictly to talking about the different types of arrowheads. For example, the name of this one compared to the name of this one, because arrowheads have a bunch of different names. You got your just generic arrowhead, you got your turkey tail arrowheads. There's just a bunch of different names for them. Uh, but that's something I want to do a lot more research on and I'll dedicate to a later video. So with all that said, I'm going to take a minute to drink my coffee, go over my notes, and if y'all have any questions, now would be the time to ask them real quick. Here we go. And I don't see any questions, so we're going to go on to the next topic. Um, like I said, some of the feedback, or one of the messages that I got back this week, well, over the last week, was I touched a little bit on Egyptian mythology. And I talked about Egyptian, Egyptian, Egyptian. I talked about Egyptian mythology when oh my phone is going off. Okay, it's not work, so we're good. I thought it was work, <laughs> but um, I talked about Egyptian mythology a little bit when I did my presentation on pottery, which a lot of people seem really interested in pottery. So that's going to be a topic we revisit at some point, and um. Before we get on with the Egyptian, about the pottery, I've been trying to get my hands on some clay so that I can do a Facebook Live pottery demonstration. The problem is, and this is what I mentioned last time, 
the clay that I use in my personal studio, studio that I use to make all my personal stuff, uh, <laughs> shipped from China. And ordering anything is a little bit of a bear right now. And now everything's shut down, so I've not been able to get any clay. I'm probably going to do a Facebook Live pottery demonstration using Play-Doh. But I'm going to try it out first before I record myself doing it. Uh, but we'll revisit pottery in the future. Because that's one of my biggest passions. So I definitely want to revisit that. But Egyptian mythology. Uh, last time we talked about their use of pottery in mummification. And what we talked about is how all their deities, their gods, related to an animal. And during mummification, they would mummify animals related to that deity. And I'm going to reuse the example that I used in the first time we touched up on this. If you lived in ancient Egypt and you worshipped Sebek, who's one of the gods of the sands, he is... Uh, depicted of being kind of like a, a crocodile or an alligator man. Human body, crocodile or alligator head. It really just depends on what you look at to decide if it's actually an alligator and actually a crocodile. But human body, that kind of head. Uh, Sebek, if you worshipped him, you would mummify and you would sacrifice crocodiles or alligators. You would mummify them. And offer them into your temple or your altar, whatever you have set up for that specific god. And cats. Cats were a huge thing in Egypt. Again, because of one of the gods. And yes, they would mummify cats as an offering to that god. Uh, cats are very popular, especially in pop culture when we deal with Egypt. Egypt? I don't know why I put an emphasis on it. But in pop culture... Cats are super popular, and we see them all the time when we talk about Egypt. Because cat mummification was one of the more popular ones, and they were revered as gods. Most cats were worshipped. The reason for that, cats were a lot more common, and you'd find them in a lot more places than, let's say, a jackal or an alligator. So that's why cats are also really popular in pop culture, just because they're one of the more common findings. Which, that's not to say they were the only one. Because again, we have found evidence of other mummified animals as sacrifice. And if you want to see some of this for yourself, look, um, or you can even Google. And if you can't find it on Google, get back with me and I'll send you the pictures. The Smithsonian Natural History Museum. They have an Egyptian exhibit with mummified animals. They had the jackal, uh, a bird, and I think three alligators. So that'd be uh, something to look up if you're just really interested. But Egyptians were very educated people, which isn't something we would we usually expect from ancient people that worshipped animals. Now Here's what I want to make really clear. We don't worship animals nowadays. Our, our deity, our God, doesn't have an animal head. But to them, this was serious. This was very, very serious. And I don't mean to laugh. Uh, I laugh all the time. So I don't mean, when I laugh, I don't mean it to sound like I'm making fun of them because I'm not. I love Egyptian mythology. But that's just what they believed in. That's what was true for them. And with mythologies, what we find a lot of is, again, we have these people that aren't as educated as we are. They need reason for why things exist. But I don't want to get into that discussion. We'll just get right back to today's topic on the Egyptian mythology. Uh, Egyptians believed a lot in the afterlife. The afterlife was a huge driving force for Egyptian religion. And we find it all the times in their writing, their art, their texts. The afterlife was a huge deal, which is part of the reason for mummification. 
But what's really cool, they also really believed in cycles of nature. And I want to apologize again real quick. The reason I keep looking off to the side, I'm going off my PowerPoint. I haven't got a good setup. I don't want my computer and my PowerPoint right here so that you can't really see my face. So until I get a better setup, I apologize. But they also really believed in cycles of nature. Cycles of nature, time, the afterlife, were huge driving forces to Egyptian religion and their mythology. And I said that we were going to talk about how some of these beliefs carried over into the settlement period. Uh, bear with me for a minute, because that's what we're going to talk about just in a second. But what's really cool about them is they're angels. Uh, nowadays, angels, we see them as humanoid figures, long, feathery, angelic wings. They also had an angel, but they didn't call it an angel. It was a scarab. And the scarab is one of those things that we see, again, just like with cats. Scarab, we see that all the time in popular pop culture when we're talking about Egypt. And if you look up ancient Egypt stuff, you're going to see the scarab a lot too. It has a very important meaning. The scarab served, for the most part, the same purpose as an angel. But it wasn't as revered or as beautiful as an angel. The scarab in some Egyptian religions was the mailman. It would pick up the soul and carry it to the afterlife. And what's really cool, if you start researching the scarab and researching Egyptian mythology and their religion, the reason that their sarcophagi were so decorated, for the most part, the sarcophagi not only would have writings and pictures of the dead person's life, but it would also be not really a prayer. I don't want to use that word, but I'm going to have to because that's the best word I can find to describe this. But you're going to find a lot of pictures of different gods, especially if they worship only one god. And imagery all going up to the top of the sarcophagi. It all leads up from the bottom to the top because it's from life to death. Uh, and the scarab is usually seen as this beautiful winged figure with light coming off of it. And most of the time, it's either going to be in the middle or at the very top because it's carrying the soul off. So Egyptian mythology, again, something I want to save and get really into depth on on its own video. But I just wanted to touch on it a little bit, kind of plant that seed and get y'all interested because that's what's going to come pretty soon. I'm going to devote an entire video to nothing but Egyptian mythology. I just wanted to touch up on it and kind of mention their religious beliefs because that's what somebody messaged me and kind of wanted me to talk about. Uh, they didn't ask me, a, ask me a specific question. They literally just said, hey, uh, could you talk about... Egyptian religious beliefs for a moment. And I was like, sure. But how did Egyptian mythology relate and carry over to the settlement period? Now, this originally was not planned for this video. This is something that I actually just learned the other day listening to a podcast. And then I researched it myself a little bit this morning. I looked more into it. And that was something that they called dream temples. And the podcast went a lot more into detail on this than I did. So if you want to listen to it yourself, I will send the link to it. But I just wanted to include this into the segment because it's really, really cool. Uh, they had what's called dream temples. And I knew that, I knew beforehand Egyptians were very, very, uh, what's the word, intense when it comes to dreams. But I didn't know it was this intense. I didn't know they dedicated entire temples to sleeping and having a dream. See, it was their belief that when you dream, that's not just your subconscious making images of desires or fears. That is your subconscious having a vision, telling you answers. And it, it gets really deep. 
These temples were designed so that you go and you tell the priest or the shaman, as some people call it, that is at that dream temple, hey, um, I have a question nobody else can answer. I want to borrow one of the dream chambers, one of the dream rooms, and dream for a moment. And the priest would do a small ceremony. And this ceremony that we see, we also see in a lot of other cultures and religions. And the basic consensus is it's a cleansing ceremony. You're getting all the negativity and everything out of the body and out of the mind so that nothing's blocking you from entering that state. So after that little cleansing ceremony, which usually would just involve bathing and then, you know, burning some kind of incense. Uh, sage is not the example I want to use, but that's what people usually think of when we think of cleansing ceremonies and burning something to cleanse the body. But it's not what they used. I actually could not find what they would use. Uh, all the articles that I found on this just said they would burn some kind of herb related to what they want done. So... Honestly, could not find anything on that. So if y'all are able to find something on that, please get back to me. So that in the next video, I can touch up on this and correct myself if I need to. This is just what I found from all the articles that I read, which is about six. But um, I digress. Anyway, they would go into this chamber, lay down, and they would sleep. And usually they would have some kind of question. What do I need to do? Um... If they were a warrior, they would ask for one of their loved ones or a god to come and talk to them. And for the most part, that's what they were doing. They wanted to have dreams of their god give them the answers that they sought. So they would sleep and they would dream. Then after they had this dream, they would go back out and find one of the priests and discuss this dream. And the priest would basically, and this is what's really fascinating to me, is even back then, they had essentially a psychologist. Because that priest would psychoanalyze and discuss that dream. And the reason we know this is because it's found in texts. It is found in basically notebooks. Basically a psychologist's notebook saying, okay, this is what they dreamed. This is what it means. Which is absolutely fascinating. But... They would have entire temples devoted to this. Now, here's where it gets cool. Because we also find people talking about this during the settlement period, during the 1800s. People talking about sleeping, having dreams specifically to dream about someone or something to find an answer. Let's say that uh, I knew, my dad passed away, and I knew that my dad... Buried a bunch of money somewhere. During the 1800s, they actually had a belief. If you dreamed hard enough, you could talk to the dead. Now, when I say they, I don't mean absolutely everybody. But it was a very common belief. You're going to find, and we can even save this for another topic, uh, settlement period beliefs. You're going to find that our ancestors, our ancestors... <laughs> had incredible supernatural and sometimes even, uh, not really philosophical, but like supernatural and, oh, my mind went blank. What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, like paranormal and superficial beliefs on a lot of, a lot of things. They had some awesome, awesome ideas but they came from some very bizarre practices that nowadays we would find absolutely insane. But it came from our ancestors. That's probably going to be another topic. But 1800s, this was another one of their beliefs. You could dream, and when you dream, you can talk to the dead. Or you could talk to angels and find the answers you seek. There are entire journals dedicated to people that have made a living off of going to sleep dreaming and either finding different medicines or finding different answers and selling those to people. And that carried over directly from Egyptian mythology. 
which is awesome. But that's all that we have today, guys. Um, I told y'all that we were going to talk a little bit about the videos moving forward. And I'm only going to touch briefly on that. I'm probably going to do one or two more videos on Facebook Live. Okay, here, here's my ideas. I'm either going to do one or two more videos on Facebook Live just to see how it goes. Or I'm going to move over to both YouTube and Facebook Live if I can figure out how that works. Or I'm just going to move strictly over to YouTube and link my videos to my Facebook page. That's kind of my idea going forward. Right now, I'm probably... Hey, Scott! Right now, I'm probably going to do one or two more videos on Facebook Live. But, uh, if you guys have any thoughts on that, definitely talk to me. But, the next topic that we're going to do... Uh, I was originally scheduled to do a Birds of Prey program later on this week. But, with all the lockdowns, not going to be able to be done. So... I'm going to bring the Bird of Prey program to you guys. I'm not going to be able to go and get a live bird and bring it into my house, sadly. I wish I could. I've done it before, but I can't do it now. <laughs> but I'm not going to be able to bring a live bird to do this Birds of Prey program. So we're going to have a little bit of fun with it. We're going to use skulls, and we're going to use this very expensive interpretation living puppet. Uh, this thing does everything but eat and poop. The eyes move, the head rotates, the wings go, and I'm going to even have some sound bites prepared for our talk on calls. So, next topic is going to be a Birds of Prey program and the usual Q&A at the beginning, um, answering any questions that you guys leave me from now until then. So, that's all I have for you guys today. If y'all have any questions about anything we said, or if you have any comments, or if you have any ideas about these videos moving forward, definitely throw them out there, either, either in the comments or send me a message. Because um, I do these videos because they're fun, but I also love getting feedback. Because that feedback that I get gives me a lot of ideas and even a lot of encouragement for the next video. So, um, otherwise, I just end up choosing the topics, and I don't want to choose a topic that nobody wants to, you know, hear about. But, um, next topic, we're going to do Birds of Prey. After that, we're either going to touch more on the settlement period beliefs, which are really, really fun, or we're going to go back to pottery, if I can figure out how to do a live pottery demonstration with Play-Doh. That's going to be <laughs> very fun and very messy. And I'm feeling sorry for my kitchen because I'm going to spend a few days seeing if that's possible. Otherwise, I'm probably going to go in my backyard, get some mud, and make my own clay. It It's possible. It doesn't always work. It really just depends on my soil, and I don't know what kind of soil I have in my backyard. So, uh, if y'all have any questions, ask them right now. I'm going to stay on the camera for just a few more minutes just to give y'all time to type. And while I wait for any questions, I'm going to add a few things to my notes for next week. Hey, Deidre. Alright, well, if y'all don't have any questions, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Again, thank you guys for listening. And if you think of any questions, if you think of a topic you'd like to hear about, or if you have any ideas for these videos moving forward, <laughs> comment or definitely shoot me a message. Um, oh, and I finally did settle on a name for these videos. Uh, I was really torn between The Talking Table, which was my favorite name, or Corbin's Curiosities. 
I'm most likely going to go with Corbin's Curiosities. Just because these videos, I always bring something off of my Curiosity shelf and share it with you guys. But, um, yeah, that's going to be it. Thank you all again. Shoot me a message if you want to or if you need to. Leave a comment. I'll definitely respond to it. And I'm probably not going to do another video today. It really just depends. I might because it's a long day and I'm bored. But uh, y'all have a great day. Thank y'all again. And I'll see y'all in the next one. If I can reach my phone.